أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي um, The way that I typically structure this appeal uh, and when I say this appeal uh, when I come into a charity for example uh, oftentimes you are given an appeal to support and that appeal is typically uh, centered around this idea that if you help, others will benefit, right? And this is completely true. Uh, everything that was just said was extremely important about how if you support this organization, who you're going to help, right? Everyone, yeah? Um, I want to actually make a little bit of a different appeal to you, a little bit of a different argument. Uh, prove a different point to you, and that is this, and something a bit different. And that is that when you support an organization like this, and when you give, you're actually giving to yourself first. That you're actually serving yourself first. Now that might seem strange, this is charity. It's, it's giving to others. But the reality is that when you support these types of causes, you're actually helping yourself first even before you're helping others. And before I get into, I usually do this using two different, um, two different ways. One is looking at it from an Islamic point of view, and the other is just simply looking at it from a secular psychological perspective. Okay, those are usually the two ways that I look at it. But even before I do that, I wanted to talk about something that I realized listening uh, about this organization, and that is this. Uh, when he was talking about individuals uh, who, for example, you know, he mentioned the, the, the brother who they, they came into his hotel room at 2 o'clock in the morning and arrested him, and he had no idea what he had done wrong, and then he sat in jail for almost a year. And I was thinking about how if that can happen to him, that can happen to me. I spent a lot of time in hotel rooms. You know, I think about, and this is exactly how we have to realize that anything that happens to others can also hit home. And if it doesn't happen to me, it can happen to my husband. And if it doesn't happen to my husband, it can happen to my father or my sister. It can happen close to home. And so the first thing we have to realize is that no one is immune to calamity. No one is immune to tragedy. No one is immune to tests, right? We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that in this life, we will be tested, right? Everyone knows this. We will be tested. Now, how will that test come? We don't know. But no one is immune to tests. And so when we hear these types of stories, they should shake us for a few reasons. First, because another human being is being harmed. Another human being is being dealt with in an unjust fashion. But there's another step that we need to realize, and that is, that could be my family. And I want it to, to come home, and the reason I want to bring it home is because essentially human beings are motivated by, by one thing, and this is all human beings, regardless of faith, regardless of where you were raised, regardless of how much money you have, every human being wants to wants self-preservation and the preservation of their family. They want safety, yeah? Every human being wants well-being and happiness, and every human being wants to be protected from harm. Regardless of faith, that's what we all are motivated for, right? And so why I want us to bring it home is that then we realize that it actually is closer to home than just an individual who we're hearing about in a talk. That that could actually be, that could come home. Now what does that do? What that does is now it motivates me not only to help others but to help myself. How am I helping myself by supporting an organization like this? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one, the obvious reason that when we fight these types of cases, then these types of cases will become less prevalent, meaning that they will be less likely to come home, right? When we fight, the fact is that he said, even though they released this gentleman, the F, they went back against the, and sued the FBI. Why? So that it doesn't happen again. 
and that's extremely important. But these are the types of things we have to support because that case to come back and sue the FBI is what's going to protect now your brother, yeah, your father, my father, and that, and, and, and ourselves, right? They 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 don't they don't discriminate by gender either, right? So the idea is that 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 it, it, there is an immediate type of um, it's relevant immediately as well, okay? The other thing is, is spiritual. I'm going to explain another concept, and that is that there's a concept that we have been told in our deen, across hadith and Qur'an. There is, a, there is a underlying concept that Allah and His Messenger repeat to us over and over and over. And that underlying concept is this. How you are with the creation is how the Creator will be with you. You catch that? How you are with the creation is how the creator will be with you. So what does that mean? It means if you are generous with the creation, the, the creator will be generous with you. If you are serving the creation, the creator will serve and help you. If you help a person in need, you know what? We have traditions of even helping an animal in need. And that people who help even, in, there, there were people who helped an animal in need and Allah helped that person. So imagine if it's a human being. And then imagine that it's a Muslim, your Muslim brother or your Muslim sister. What does that mean about what Allah will do for you? So what, what does this mean for me personally? Because I think too often we look at it as something far away. And maybe if I'm very generous, I might give a couple hundred dollars, right? But I don't want you to think it's something far away. What if it was your brother? You'd give more than a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, if it was your father, if it was your son. Do you understand? And that's how we have to think about it because it is, it is protecting our home as well. And so the idea here is that not only from a, from a legal perspective, yes, from a legal perspective, when we support the, the suing of of the FBI against, for, because of the, this um, unconstitutional action, then it helps to prevent it from happening again, right? But I want to talk to you from another perspective, and that is that from a spiritual perspective, Allah has told us that if we want protection, that if we want generosity from Allah, that if we want help from Allah, we need to protect, serve, and be generous to others. And that's actually the fastest way to get that from Allah. Who here doesn't want the protection of Allah? Who here is not desperately in need of the protection of Allah? There's no one, obviously. We are all completely dependent on the protection of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the provision of ar razzaq And this is one of the most reliable ways to protect our own selves and our families is to, is to be active in helping to protect others. Do you guys understand? So I, I urge you for your own good and the good of your own family that every single person before you leave to support in some way or another this organization. And I truly believe that that is helping to safeguard your own family and yourselves. Yeah, because this is what Allah has told us. Allah and His Messenger have told us again and again this parallel. There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, Be merciful to those on the earth, and the one in the heavens will be merciful to you. And then the other side, right? Those who do not show mercy to people or to the creation will not be shown mercy by the Creator. You see? And there are countless examples of this. Another hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ tells us that if you help a person in need, obviously there are people in need right now. If you help a person in need, guess what happens to you? Allah will help you when you're in need. And not only will Allah help you when you're in need in this life, now this is bigger, He will help you when you're in need in the next life. And that's when we're going to be the most in need. When we come in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, that's when we're going to be the most desperate for help. And no one will be safe except who Allah saves. Do you know that the Prophet ﷺ said that no one enters paradise only by their deeds, except that Allah has mercy on that person. And the companion said, even you, O Rasulullah, he is the best in deeds, right? And he said, even me. 
So what does that tell us about ourselves? We are desperately in need of the mercy and protection of Allah or none of us would enter paradise. By helping another person when they're in need in this life, Allah protects us, not only in this life. Allah serves and, and, and gives us help in not only this life, but in the next life when we're going to be desperate for that help. The other concept which we have to realize is this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about justice, honestly, I was doing some research about justice. The ayat and the hadith about justice in Islam blew my mind. What they made me realize is that pretty much, see, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the foundation of, of how he ordered this universe, he says it's based in justice. Based on justice. That justice is one of the most important principles, not only of Islam, but in the law of the universe. That it must be done with justice. And anything that breaks that law, breaks the law of the universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in one, in many very, very uh, powerful ayat. One of them, Allah says, O oh, you who believe, stand firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even if it is against yourselves, against your parents, against your relatives, or whether it is against the rich or the poor. Look at what Allah is telling us, that justice must be served even if it has to be against your own self. And who's most beloved after that? Your parents, your relatives. That you must be a people of standing up for justice. That this is an essential of our deen. That means it's a fard. It means that the fight for justice, in whatever way we can, to stand up to defend justice, is actually a fard. It's an, what is a fard? An obligation. It's an obligation upon us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he has forbidden injustice upon himself and he has forbidden it upon us. We must be a people to fight for justice. You know there's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ tells us, if you see something wrong, see sometimes, sometimes we have this mistake within our narrative where we sort of teach to, um, this narrative of being passive. You know a concept called turn the other cheek? Have you heard this concept before? It's not an Islamic concept. But sometimes we take concepts like sabr. Have you ever heard that? Have sabr, sister. Yeah? Yeah? Have sabr, brother. What does it mean? Well, a person who's being treated unjustly sometimes is told, have sabr. And what does that mean? Well, unfortunately, it's in the context that it's being said, it means turn the other cheek. It means do nothing. It means be passive. That is not an Islamic concept. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that if you see something wrong, he said to take action. He said if you see something wrong, try to change it with your hand. You see, he doesn't say if you see something wrong, have sabr sister or have sabr brother or turn the other cheek. He says, try to change it with your hand. And then he says, if you cannot, then with your tongue, speak out against it. And if you cannot, then at least hate it in your heart. And this is the weakest of Iman. So, uh, so the Prophet ﷺ has actually linked the fight for justice with Iman, with faith. He says that it is the weakest of Iman to just at least hate injustice, even if you can't do any action against it. But what is the best thing is to not only hate it, but to take action against it. That is Islam. That is what we're taught. We are not taught to be passive. We are not taught to roll over and play dead. We are not taught to turn the other cheek. That is not Islam. Islam is a, is a, is a religion based in justice. Something that's very, very amazing is that when Allah talks about the worst of sins, what is the worst sin out there? Shirk, thank you very much. What is shirk? To associate a partner with Allah, yeah? Do you know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains or describes shirk? In Surah Luqman, Luqman says, inna shirk la dhulmun azim, that shirk, indeed shirk, is a what? A great injustice, dhulm. 
Zulm is the worst thing you can do. Injustice. Injustice not only to Allah, but to your own self. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes sin in the Qur'an, do you know how Allah describes sin in the Qur'an? Do you know when Adam, the first, the first uh, slip that happened by a human being, what was it? By a human being eating from the tree, right? Adam alayhi salam and Hawa ate from the tree that they were not that they were forbidden from. Do you know what they said? What's their famous dua that's mentioned in the Quran? Rabbana zalamna anfusina wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al khasirin. They are saying, "Oh our Lord, we have done injustice to our own selves." Again, injustice. The the first slip to be done by a human being is being referred to as injustice. Injustice is literally the worst thing. And that's why the worst sin, shirk, is zulmun azim, described as an in, the great injustice. It is a great injustice. That when they slipped, Adam and Hawa said, we have wronged our own selves. We've done injustice to our own selves. Injustice is the worst thing. And our job, one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-adl. What's al-adl? The most just. He is the source of justice. He is the most just. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he has forbidden injustice upon himself. He, he is the most just and he has forbidden it upon us. So we have to be a people who stand for justice. And when we stand for justice, Allah will stand with us. You know, one of the most amazing things you'll find is that, and this, this kind of takes me to the other side, the psychological aspect of it, yeah? I mentioned to you that every single individual is motivated for the same thing essentially, and that is self-preservation, happiness and well-being, and to, and to um, protect themselves from harm and pain. That's regardless, an atheist, an agnostic, a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, every, that's human nature. Yeah. So what they've done is they've started to do a lot of research about happiness. It's like the new wave of psychology. How can we become happier people? How can we have increase our well-being? How can we live more uh, meaningful lives? And you know that across all this research, what they've found, after you look at all this research, you know what it boils down to? There's a portion of our happiness which is somewhat inherited. It's 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 you know it's sort of um, what they call baseline happiness. It's something that we're just given, right? But it's only a portion. It's only about half. So that leaves us with about 10% is from, you know, being as long as you have safety and you have enough, you know, to, to keep you all right in that regard. So that means you have 40%. And they are now studying that 40%. What can we do with that 40% to become happier people and increase well-being. And you know that across the research what they found one of the most reliable and powerful ways to increase happiness and well-being it is service to others. It is service to others. It is helping others even money. You know like I say this in my other talks and people always think I'm a little crazy um, but I tell you that um, they told you that money doesn't buy happiness, right? They lied. Yeah, they found that money buys happiness. So this is where everyone thinks I'm crazy. Um, they found that money buys happiness when it is spent on others. That's amazing. And interestingly enough, it doesn't buy happiness when it's spent on ourselves. Like, that's amazing. So what they did is they've done studies, yeah? And what they'll do is they'll have, they'll look at the different groups of people. Those who spent the money on themselves. You know this concept of treat yourself, right? S indulge. And the idea is that that's going to make you happy, but it doesn't. And I'm not telling you like Islamic scholars are saying this. I'm telling you this is secular psychology. It's saying that it just doesn't improve happiness. It doesn't increase their happiness when they spend their money on themselves. Even if they're splurging on something they really, really wanted, it might give them, uh, you know, that, that temporary <coughs> spike, uh, but actually it's not shown to improve the overall happiness. But what's amazing is when that money is spent on others, it does. It actually makes, it increases that person's happiness. So you can tell people money does buy happiness, but only when it is spent on others. Now, let's take that a step further. 
What does Allah and his messenger say about money? I asked you guys before you leave to support this organization. And I told you, you know what? I'm not even making an appeal, support this organization to support others. I'm telling you, support this organization to support yourselves, to protect your own homes, aren't I? Because essentially, the, the most effective way to, to improve or to protect me is that I fight to protect others. And this is Islamically and this is psychologically. And I'm talking to you right now, the psychological aspect of it. I told you that it improves happiness, right? Well-being. But you know what Allah and His Messenger tell us about money? This is the amazing thing about money, is that no one's taking their money to their grave, right? Anyone in this room gonna go to their grave with their money? Okay, no one, no one is delusional, alhamdulillah, in this room. No one is taking their money to their grave. That's actually not true either. There is money that will go to your grave. Anyone know what it is? Very good. I can leave. You already know. The Prophet ﷺ said that all the deeds end when you enter your grave except for three. Except for three. And one of those is something called sadaqa jariya. It is a sadaqa or a charity that continues to benefit others. That that will continue to benefit you in your grave. That money and only that money that fits those three or, or those three categories will come back to your grave. Therefore, guess what? All your money is lost except the money that you use for the sake of Allah. And you know why that's so amazing? Because we think the opposite. We think, no, no, let me hold on to my money so I can keep it. But in fact, it's the money you hold on to that you lose. That's like turn your brain upside down stuff, right? It's the money you hold on to that you lose. And it's the money you give for Allah's sake that you keep. And not only do you see it in this life, and I guarantee you, you will see it back in this life. And not only do you see it back in this life, you see it multiplied because Allah is al karim he's, he's the most generous. He doesn't just give back for what we give. We're not equal with Allah in generosity. You know what I'm saying? If I'm karima, if you're karim, well, guess what? Allah's more karim. So if you give out of your own human generosity, well, Allah is more generous. So he gives back multifold many fold to what you gave and that giving back doesn't doesn't only happen it happens it doesn't only happen in the hereafter it will happen in this life before the next and this is why the prophet sallallahu said that no wealth is decreased through sadaqah do you know that's very very deep no wealth is decreased through sadaqah so you're not losing your money when you give it to allah but i'm going to tell you something else I'm actually going to tell you that you increase your money when you give it for Allah's sake. That's really interesting phenomenon. You know this concept of investment banking, investments, right? I don't know nothing about it, right? But if I were up here and I was an investment specialist, I would tell you, look, guys, you put this much into investment and you'll grow your money, right? But there's like certain things. Now, you guys are adults, so you can maybe understand that concept. But if I were telling a little kid, five-year-old kid who just got allowance of $10. Hey, give me that $10 and I'll invest it. That kid will think what? No. <laughs> Why? Because that kid thinks they're losing that $10. You guys understanding? Why? Because the child doesn't understand the concept of investment. If it's not in my hand, it must be lost. That's what the child thinks. Sometimes we, we have that same understanding of money. We don't realize that when you give for Allah's sake, you are investing that money. You're not losing it. You're not losing it. In fact, the only money you're losing is the one that you're keeping in your bank because eventually you're going to your grave and that money is not coming back with you. It's the money you invested with Allah that comes back to you. And wallahi, it comes back in this life multifold before the next. Isn't that amazing? This is the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He tells you to give. Look what he does. 
he tells you to give. First, he gives you happiness just by giving, right? He gives you happiness. It feels good to give. In fact, it's one of the most reliable ways to be happy is to give, is to serve. And not only does he make you feel good, he will give you back that money in this life, not the same, but multiplied. And that's a promise. And not only that, he will give it back to you in the grave and he will give it back to you on the day of judgment. Look at the generosity of Allah. So wouldn't I be foolish to not take that deal? It's a pretty good deal, right? Wouldn't I be foolish not to take that deal? I talk about Black Friday deals because I think it's a very interesting um, psychological experiment. You guys know what I'm talking about? After Thanksgiving sales. So what's interesting about after Thanksgiving sales is it tells us a lot about human nature. And one of the things it tells us is that human beings love a deal. Okay? The types of things that a human being will do to get a deal is astounding. Okay? In some parts of the country, people will stand in lines in freezing cold weather outside Best Buy, you know it, to save a few dollars. And that's a fact. They will stand in lines, and I'm talking hours. Sometimes they'll camp out outside of these stores in order to save a few dollars. People even are, in fact, people actually die. There are cases where someone, each Black Friday, uh, each, each after Thanksgiving sale, um, that, on that day someone dies. Um, oftentimes, it's because of stampedes trying to get a deal. All right, crazy stuff that we do. I mean, now they've, of course, they kept, I remember, they kept, they keep making it earlier and earlier to make more and more money. Um, so now it's literally qiyam at the mall, right? It's actually qiyam at the mall because it's like two o'clock in the morning and you're at the mall and then you're doing tawaf at the mall. So it's like, it's like intense religious practice, but it's for money, okay? My point is that we as human beings will wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning to go get a deal. I'm not telling you this as a theory. It's a fact. You know you've done it once or twice. Even if you haven't, others have. Okay? That we will wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning to go to the mall and get a deal. We'll stand outside. We'll freeze. There was one lady. She was macing people so that she could get the video game first at Walmart. Okay? So it's very interesting to look at human nature. Now, what's my point? My point is that we love a deal as a human being. But look at the deal God's making. Look at the deal God's making. Allah's deals aren't like human deals because human deals can only be finite deals, right? You save $50, you save $500, great. Even if it's a matter of $5 million of savings, it's still finite. Allah's deal is infinite. That Allah says we do this small thing and Allah in exchange will give us something infinite. Jannah is not finite, right? Jannah doesn't have an end. Allah's mercy cannot be quantified, right? It doesn't have a beginning and an end. These are infinite things. So Allah's deal is a Black Friday deal times infinity. You understand? But do we take these deals? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting this for us. Now, before we inshallah end, I want to share with you guys a hadith that always strikes me. Um, it's a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu talks about the most beloved people to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Now, I want you guys to take a moment and think about that for a second. If you were to bring to mind the image in your in your head of someone who Allah loves, what does that person look like? What is that person's uh, appearance? What is that person's behavior like? What do you imagine? Think about it for a second. Just take a couple seconds. You don't have to say anything. Just, just bring it to mind. <coughs> All right, now that you've done that, I can guess that there's a certain image that you had in your mind. For example, a person who spends a lot of their time in the masjid. Yeah? Fair enough. Maybe someone who does i'tikaf. What's i'tikaf? Seclusion in the masjid. You know in Ramadan, people spend days, sometimes all of Ramadan, last 10 days. That this is what we think of when we think about a very pious person who's beloved to Allah. Yeah? Can I tell you that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that blows, will blow your mind. The Prophet ﷺ says that the most beloved people to Allah are those who help and benefit others the most. 
Look at that. Who help and benefit others the most. And listen to this. The most beloved actions to Allah. So now we're thinking prayer, right? Reading Quran. Do these kinds of ritual act actions. Look at what the Prophet ﷺ said. The most beloved actions to Allah is pleasure and happiness that you cause to enter the heart of a Muslim or to solve one of his or her problems or to pay off his or her debt or to prevent him or her from being hungry. Now watch this. And working to help my Muslim brother or sister is more beloved to me. Now this is the Prophet I said I'm speaking. He says that working to help my Muslim brother or sister is more beloved to me than making atikaf, seclusion, in this masjid for a month. Do you see how powerful that is? And I was, you know, we need to mention that which masjid is the Prophet I said I'm standing in? Not this masjid. Masjid the Nabawi in Medina. Yeah, that's the one that people from all over the world spend their entire lives, their savings, just to go once, right? One prayer, a thousand in another. The Prophet ﷺ is saying that for me, it's more beloved to, to help my brother in need, my sister in need, someone in need, than to be an atikaf, something that is the pinnacle of what we think of in terms of righteousness. He said it is more beloved than doing atikaf for a month in Masjid al-Nabawi of Medina. Do you see? This is a religion. This is a deen of service. We need to realize that yes, we have rituals. Yes, we have salah. Yes, we have fasting. Yes, we have Quran. But this is a deen of service. Can I tell you that when the Prophet ﷺ first received his revelation, if you look at Surah Al-Muzammil, and Surah Al-Muddathir, these ayat were among the very first ayat at the beginning of this, of this mission. You know what the Prophet ﷺ is told to do? He's actually one of the first things he's commanded to do is قُمِ اللَّيْلَ قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Stand at, and pray at night, except for a little bit. So the big portion of the night, except for a little bit. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him why. And he says, إِنَّ لَكَ فِي النَّهَارِ سَبَحًا طَوِيلًا Because you got a lot of work to do in the day. You get it? The prayer isn't just for the sake of the prayer. Yes, we pray because it is part of our worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is fuel to do what? To serve. To serve. The Prophet Sallallahu is being given the commandment to pray at night. Why? Because he's got work to do to serve people in the day. أقولي قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك